All right, so on the presentation number two, uh, this one is, we're going to be talking a little bit more about the Bentho side of things, uh, using acoustic modems on wave gliders and having them talk to uh, other robots and sensors. I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Joe Borden to come up from Benthos and, and assist in this presentation. Um, and for, for the majority of it, uh, I'm going to be talking more about uh, the applications and, and the sort of the overall wave gliders. And Joe can get into a lot of the details on what the specific modems you would use for that and what the, those characteristics are. I'm not, I'm, I'm not as uh, up to date on that side of things. Um, as Daryl mentioned, we've been working with Teledyne forever. It uh, feels like um, in the robotic space, that's not true. It only says six years, right? So it's six or seven years. Uh, Liquid Robotics has only been around 10 years, and the early days didn't have much sensor integration at all. For, so for us, this is, this is really forever and goes way back. Um, and we've, we've worked really closely with Teledyne, too. So I do want to th throw that out there. You know, We've done sensor integrations with them, software development, uh, in water testing, Joe was telling me about you know some of this the, the hard work he's been putting in with many of the members on our team and and the long nights trying to you know figure out what the hell's going on. So all that good stuff. And then the, the characterization, which um, you know I'd say six years ago we didn't think was an issue at all and uh, had to learn that the uh, the tough way. Um, so you know we we really do appreciate the working relationship and you know it's I think it's been helpful for both companies to have that. So I mentioned the towing uh, at the end of the last presentation. It's really become one of those things we didn't, I think, anticipate when we first started the company as being a, a key uh, component of the wave glider, but has, be, has probably become our most significant uh, addition to the vehicle overall. Um, it's got basically applications across the board, you know, defense, as um, I think largely been the primary driver, but a lot of the sci uh, scientific stuff actually um, sort of led the way on the creation and the, the early testing days of it. And then, of course, the commercial, uh, you know, fishing and other sorts of applications are, are picking it up as, as it goes along. Um, when we first started the wave glider, the intention was to basically to... Uh, to listen for whale noises. So it was, it was designed intentionally as an acoustic platform that had persistence, uh, but without being tied down to a, a single spot. And it, so it needed to be quiet. It needed to not have you know, a motor attached to it or something else that would interfere with this passive detection of uh, the whale noises. And then it needed to be able to broadcast those back to shore. Those were all sort of the, the early design characteristics. And we've maintained that throughout the years. Uh, not specific, we're no longer clearly just a, a company that listens to whales. That, that still happens. There's a number of other applications, though, that we've done. And uh, you know, I think as part of that, we've, we've also seen that the active acoustics really benefit from that same really quiet environment with, uh, with great noise signature or noise uh, characteristics. Um, it really it lets us extend the range on a lot of the modems um, and without increasing the power to a way where we we're, can't handle it on the size of the vehicle that we're using. Um, the persistence, again, you know, harping on that persistent link, it's uh, one of the major benefits of the wave glider is that, um, you know, compared to a ship or something, you can have this out there on the, the scale of months uh, to a year. And, uh, and the, the cost doesn't drive up dramatically to, to get that sort of continuous link. Um, and then also, of, of course, the navigational and, and being able to, to change your mission midway. Um, you know, we've had many folks uh, <clears throat> use wave gliders with acoustic modems uh, where they're basically, they sit over a station, they talk to it for a little bit, and then they move on. Uh, you know, o OTN gave a presentation earlier, Adam from OTN gave the presentation earlier, and, and they use a wave glider to do that exact thing where they're offloading a series of, of receivers off the floor. So, you know, it's, it's got this basically replacing the ship's time doing this long, tedious method, um, while also giving that real time so that you know it's actually working and you can adjust on the fly if, if things are um, messing up. So. The typical system is, um, you know, everything outside the circle, liquid robotics, uh, 
everything inside the circle, Teledyne. Um, so it's nice and neat in that regard. Again, you have the wave glider, you have your eight meter tether, you umbilical, you have the subsection, and then we have this uh, towed system that has a tow cable on it with a series of floats and weights. Uh, the floats and weights are there, they, they separate out the, um, the tow body from the rest of the system. Uh, and then inside uh, the tow body, um, put a number of different things. One of the ones we commonly put in uh, is the Benthos, the ATM 900. Um, do you want to speak more to that? Yeah, so it, it's, uh, it's a Benthos uh, OEM board set with a transducer. Uh, we work really closely with Liquid Robotics on the integration of that in there to make sure that both serial data and electrical energy down to the modem was, was really optimized for this application. Uh, we go as far as we actually get tow bodies. We, we would test, uh, manufacture and test the acoustic modems, ship them out to Liquid Robotics. They integrate it into the tow body. They then ship the tow body back to us, and we run it through acoustic tests in our pool to make sure it still meets the factory specifications. So it's a, a very synergistic uh, relationship that we have with Liquid Robotics as far as how we you know, implement and test all this equipment. Um, typically, you know, we're selling one part to them, someone else is buying another modem that goes on a mooring on a sea floor, uh, and the wave ladder goes out, collects data off of that mooring, and then moves on to the next mooring. So, that briefly kind of mentioned the, the tow cable on the previous one. The tow cable has really, really been a, a key implementation. Uh, we struggled with it in the early days. We had a lot of uh, early deployments of uh, towed sensors. Uh, that weren't anticipated, uh, so so that was an issue for us. We've we've spent um, the better part of the last three or four years working on on making sure that that doesn't happen. So some of these have been through uh, that the C states seven and such that we're talking about are all including tow bodies and those sorts of applications. So so very big C states. Uh, it also because of that S cable that you get from the floats and weights, what you're doing is you're isolating a lot of the noise and the motion of the wave glider. Uh, so the float hitting the sea surface and the waves and smacking in and causing that sort of noise with bubbles going in as the, as the waves flow under the float, uh, the wings flapping up and down, moving through the water, hitting against the, the wing stops or the springs bending, all of those sort of things are now isolated by uh, generally around a 13 meter tow cable. And additionally, the wave glider, due to its navigation uh, and propulsion method of going, of being wave generated, uh, tends to be fairly herky-jerky. Uh, so it gets lifted up on, on uh, waves and then it, it glides down, lifted up, glides down. So it tends to be this, this really um, uh, just chaotic uh, um, flow and movement pattern, and then the, the tow cable with the tow body behind it adds a dampening layer, um, and, then, and then so this guy, instead of moving up and down or anything else, just flowing smoothly through the water system, provides a nice quiet environment for the testing as well. So, and Joe can speak a little bit more to, to some of these details. We've, we've demonstrated some pretty impressive performance benefits with these. Um, We've, uh, <clears throat> I'll, I'll talk a little bit to the station keeping. You know, one of the things people tend to think of when, when they think uh, surface vessels is that they're, they're not terribly pre precise. We found that with the wave glider, it's actually been the exact opposite. A, a 100 meter watch circle is, is pretty common, um, and that tends to be a very conservative. You can, you can certainly get it down to sub five meters if needed uh, for, for periods of time. <clears throat> So, and, and the other benefit to the wave glider is it doesn't really care if it's in 500 meters of water or, or 6,000 meters of water, that 100 meter water circle stays consistent. So unlike a buoy, which is, uh, you know, one and a half or so of the, of the depth, we, we're, we're staying really close. And you can see this uh, mission, the orange are uh, the target waypoints and yellow uh, are the actual vehicle track. And you can see we're going around um, a subsea node and we're, we're doing a, basically a concentric circles as we get closer and closer. And, and really, uh, you know, it looks, it looks pretty nice. 
Um, I'll let Joe talk to the, the, some of the performance we've seen and, and maybe even uh, some of the specifics on that. Yeah, so the, uh, the, the wind glider in, in this application, with the tow body behind it, the tow body is just a beautiful environment for acoustics because it's very quiet. You don't have to deal with vessel noise, you don't have to deal with you know, wave slap up at the surface. Um, so we get really, really strong communications to nodes that are down you know, more than 4,000 meters deep. Uh, we get full acoustics from 300 bits per second all the way up to 1,200, I even see 2,400 bits per second through the water. Varying power levels, we, we vary the power level from you know, maximum transit power to down to about 30% of that. And we're still getting solid communications acoustically through that water column of you know, more than 4,000 meters. Uh, it's been very, very robust in terms of the communication um, up and down. And again, we, we've seen where we've varied it. It's, it's a directional transducer typically, which has a plus or minus 30 degree beam pattern. We've gone all the way out to the edge of that beam pattern and still had outstanding communications as the wind pattern around. Excellent. Going to go through a few different uh, use cases of folks that have been using uh, wave gliders to communicate uh, to, to subsea systems, if you will. Um, I'll probably, look, I think through the next few slides here, going to go through, describe the use case, describe um, the application and, and what's happening, and then I'll, I'll let Joe speak to uh, what, what modems you might use or are being used uh, in order to, to uh, facilitate that. As, as that side, I'm, I, again, less uh, familiar with. So the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute up in my neck of the woods in the San Francisco Bay Area uh, has, has done a couple cool projects with their wave gliders. Um, the, the first one is with the Tethys long range AUV that they got. It's a buoyancy aided AUV, um, a kind of a you know, three week duration type of thing. It sits in the water column, you know, can, can move around. Um, on the wave glider itself, they've added the Embora calls it a hot spot, so it has a number of different communication channels, the acoustic modem, uh, <clears throat> RF comms, etc., for, for shoreside com comms. And then on top of that, the hot spot also has a little bit of uh, a chicken brain aspect to it, where it's uh, on board navigating the wave glider, as well as sending <clears throat> commands and navigation to the long-range AUVs. And so, what they've really managed to do with this is create an adaptive, real-time sampling system. And so it's not that any one vehicle is doing uh, the entire uh, set, but instead the wave glider acting as a mothership is giving commands and gathering data from the LRAUVs. Uh, and then those LRAUVs are, are basically, depending on what they're sending back, will change how the wave plotter is deciding to, to manage the rest of the mission. And so these vehicles are now doing it in concert with no input uh, from a human other than sort of quality checks and, and observance standpoint. And, and we're talking on a period of weeks. Uh, so one of the missions that they did is an algal bloom uh, in the Monterey Bay. The LREB sits in the, um, goes, they find this algal bloom, they put the one LRAUV in the middle of the valve bloom, set it to float mode. Uh, they have another LRAUV doing circles around the edge of the, uh, the alpha bloom, trying to find the leading edges and determine which direction it's heading. And then the wave glider on top, taking that data, telling uh, the one LRA, the one TEP is doing the lead, um, the lead detection where it's going, telling the other one that's in the float mode where it should be going, and then following along behind and all doing that autonomously. Uh, so it's a pretty cool solution. Um, for the modems? Yeah, so in this case, they're not using a tow body. They are actually mounted the, uh, the transducer of the modem on the float back at the skeg at the back of the, uh, the wave ladder. Um, I know that they've done a couple things. They've integrated both modems and what we call a DAT, a directional acoustic transponder. It's essentially a modem and a USB-L system combined. So not only are they getting the ability to communicate with the, the AV, they're able to position it as well as it's moving around. So um, they've done this on a number of different um, wave gliders now where they, um, you know, where they, they swap components in and out. Um, 
So again, it's, uh, it's the modem is up in the you know, payload up on the wave glider float, and the transducer is actually mounted uh, on the skeg at the back of the wave glider. So unlike the previous example, which had a tow body, this is all integrated right onto the wave glider itself. Excellent. Uh, another application that MBAR is doing is uh, they have a benthic rover that sits in the, in the um, canyon in Monterey Bay and meanders along. Um, it gets about three meters a day. So uh, over the course of the weeks and months that they leave it out there, it travels with a fair amount. Um, it's not consistent, and the direction is not consistent. Uh, and so historically what they would be doing is they'd go out with their ship and then they go to where they thought it was and they take a, you know, to take a ping and see if they could find it, and then they sort of have to do loops and basically have to search the thing out. And they got, you know, plots, and sometimes it moves way further than they had expected it to, and they're, they're left with a lot of time on the ship just trying to figure out where it is. Uh, so when they got the wave glider and they put it on this hotspot, they said, well, hey, this is, you know, this is something a robot should be doing instead of people, right? It's, it's, it's stupid, boring, and, and expensive to be doing this with people. Why not have the robot go do it? Uh, so they pass the wave glider every week or couple weeks, whenever they sort of have time in the schedule, and the wave glider goes out, and it goes to the known locations, and then it's doing sort of the ranging, and it's doing it all autonomously until it finds it. Uh, and then when it finds it, it can find the precise location. Uh, it can offload data, and then if they need to go out, and they need to you know, do some repairs or maintenance or other things on that. Um, then they're going out and they, the boat just zips out right to where it's at. They, they have, you know, they can plan around that. They know what the schedule's gonna be. There's no surprises in, hey, whether or not we're gonna find it in the next six hours or not. Uh, so it adds a lot more, you know, it, it, it's just, a, it's been a really uh, important tool in a way that they, I don't think, anticipated when they first got the wave gliders. Um, I, I suspect that the modems on the, on the rover are pretty similar to the, yeah. the long-range AV, so it's all a very similar application. Correct. Um, and, you know, this is down in, in a few thousand meters of water, too, so it's the, it's the same sort of long-range acoustic comms that they're doing, which has been pretty cool. Uh, across the country, uh, at Hui, um, the Lee Fry Tag has uh, used wave gliders as a positioning device. Um, this little map up here shows uh, his project. He was basically measuring the, um, the, the travel of waves through ocean ice, the, the ice sheets. Uh, so one of the things he was planning on doing on his mission was he had a number of different uh, um, measuring stations on top of the ice sheet. And then underneath the ice sheet, he had a couple of buoyancy gliders. I believe they were still functional, though I'm not positive on that. Um, basically doing uh, profiles below the ice sheet. So he was worried before the mission that basically the buoyancy gliders weren't going to be able to talk to the uh, receivers that were on the surface. And so in a very uh, short amount of time, would lose their positioning and and would just be sort of, you know, have, the, the data wouldn't be great, and, and then, you know, the worst case, they're not going to be able to recover them. So he had the idea to have two wave gliders at a distance off of the ice sheet uh, doing horizontal uh, ranging for them. So the wave gliders are basically just stations offshore that would then do acoustic comms to the buoyancy gliders, be able to at least give them some level of uh, navigational control. And, and be able to have a successful mission. Um, ultimately, uh, after doing the mission, you know, Lee figured out that he could actually talk to the and, and hear the, the uh, <clears throat> above ice uh, stations with the buoyancy gliders. So the wave gliders didn't uh, perform as uh, critical of a role, but they were still out there collecting a lot of in situ data about the um, you know the near ice sheet area, and so they were they were still very valuable in that context. Yeah, he was using his own his own modes, own modes, yeah. uh, but with a Benbo's transducer. Yes, he does. Have <coughs> with the, uh, the microphone. And and so that's another. You know, we're um, it, even when it's not a full Benbo uh, solution, there are bits and pieces and, and and ways to work together with a lot of these different uh, modems and other things that are out there to make sure that you have a successful mission depending on whatever you might have installed. Um, Similarly to like what Ambari was doing, uh, Kinsey at Woods Hole was also using wave gliders to 
uh, the relay stations to to do relay stations for their AUV, specifically the Eco Mapper and the Iver. Um, again, it was. It was the, the appeal of adaptive sampling that has really got these guys excited about having a multiple vehicle coordinated robotic solution uh, where as the AUV is progressing through the water column, if it makes a detection of a different type of, you know, of, of, of something of interest, then it can change its mission midway through, continue the performance, and not scare the hell out of everyone above it that wonders why it hasn't come to the surface at a pre-programmed time. Uh, and so, as well, or, you know, take up the entire uh, rest of the boat to do that one specific mission of monitoring the AUV in that location. Uh, so the wave glider allows it to be a relay to shore or ship, and uh, as well as provide this, this you know, intelligent system and using the, the vehicles, um, it, using their different strengths in order to solve a, a much more complicated uh, problem. And I think, uh, I think this sort of stuff's gonna be really exciting uh, over the next few years as we start to see more specialized vehicles doing their specific things, but in this larger context of, a, of an autonomous program that is, that is doing um, you know, a much more complicated mission uh, but, but much cheaper and, and uh, much less time intensive than what it's historically taken. Um, fair enough. I believe that was also the, uh, similar to Freitag with the Huey Micromodem and the, and the Benthos transducers on it. So, um, <clears throat> Lastly, the, this was an interesting one. It's, it's, it's local here over at Scripps. Uh, John Berger and John Orcutt have this uh, ADOS system, uh, Autonomous Deployable Deep Ocean Seismic System, another mouthful of an acronym. Um, but this one's interesting. On the very first slide, and I don't know who was paying attention, but there were, well, I guess middle slide, uh, given the presentation, um, there is a picture of a big orange tow body behind the wave glider on, on the intro slide to this deck. And the idea behind that was that <clears throat> These guys were actually going to put their bottom sensor into a tow body, attach it to the wave glider, tow it out to station, deploy it, have it sink to the floor, and then maintain station and, and basically broadcast in, in a persistent manner over the rest of the, um, as long as they needed uh, <clears throat> until the batteries died, basically. Um, the bottom sensor is 50,000 or less. And so compared to the ship time to do a deployment and a recovery is effectively expendable. Uh, and so this would be a, you know, a two year mission where the wave glider drags out the, this bottom sensor, deploys it, sits on top of it, records the data back in real time. And now you have a, a seismic station in an area where you know, cables aren't cost effective and, and nothing else really makes sense. Uh, and you could have several of these at the same cost of basically doing, you know, the one ship time that it would take to get out there and, and, uh, and deploy in one, in one location. <clears throat> so this project was actually largely responsible for the development of the tow body. It was, um, <clears throat> it was one of the earlier systems where we were trying to do the acoustic comms, which was pretty cool stuff. And uh, they've done some, some really good testing as well. Uh, 1,000 meters off of the shallow water um, right here, and then they went uh, you know, a couple hundred miles offshore uh, La Jolla as well into much deeper water and had uh, you know, consistent and uh, persistent measurements of, the, of this um, <clears throat> ocean bottom seismologer that they, seismolog uh, <laughs> hour later, words are hard, um, the, the OBS. Uh, in, uh, in near real time. Um, there was a Chilean earthquake that happened a year and a half ago, two years ago, a big, a big eight uh, plus, and uh, it was actually, this was out there doing the testing at that time at the station of a, uh, of a NOAA dart buoy that had gotten swept off and, and wasn't on station, and, uh, and managed to record both the uh, seismic activity and the tsunami wave you know, of, of centimeter level, but still tsunami wave that came as a result of that earthquake. So, so they have pretty good success on this. Um, and 
I'll, I'll let Joe speak a bit to the... They usually work together. Same, yeah. Um, but you're, you know, you're getting this uh, 4,500 uh, with, with pretty meter depth with pretty high um, communication rate. And the, you know, all of this stuff is, uh, is totally transferable between the different, um, the different types of modems. So the, uh, the modems and um, transducer combo that Joe was talking about at the beginning that was uh, measuring that 5,500 meter uh, <clears throat> depth at the, you know, 20, what was it, 2,400? 2,400 bits per second is totally applicable in, in all of these situations. Um, and so it's really an interesting concept to have the wave glider be this gateway package and, and really allow um, that real-time access to what's below the sea surface. It opens up a, a lot um, of interesting possibilities, we think, and, and are seeing as our various customers are doing it. So uh, with that, I'll take questions. Teledyne Marine. Everywhere you look.